I'm Scott Harris and serve as state health officer. Uh, the, I'm the chief executive for the public health department in the state of Alabama. And, and again, it, it really is a, a terrific opportunity for me to join you today. We appreciate so much the relationship that we've had with Esri and we have uh, done many exciting things over the past few years. And, and it's my privilege to be able to talk to you about those today. Um, if you talk about uh, GIS and public health, um, that, that's a story that actually didn't begin in the 21st century or even the 20th century. Uh, many of you uh, already know this story quite well. It's certainly well known, but um, I, I can't fail to mention uh, the, uh, the father of modern epidemiology, uh, Dr. John Snow, who was a, a physician in London uh, in the 1850s. Dr. Snow, uh, as many of you know this story very well, uh, was investigating a cholera outbreak. And, and this was many years before uh, people understood that cholera was uh, transmitted by contaminated water or by sewage uh, contamination of food. Uh, no one really knew how someone acquired cholera. And so Dr. Snow uh, spent uh, months uh, walking around door to door in central London, knocking on doors and counting numbers of cholera cases and came up with a map that actually doesn't look a lot different than this modernized version that you see right here. But Dr. Snow was the first person to, who really understood that there was a geographic clustering uh, of disease. Uh, and in this case, uh, it turned out to be around the water pump on Broad Street, uh, which is still there today. The, the water pump was pumping water from uh, a water source. It was contaminated and, and full of uh, sewage from open sewers. Uh, and so this was really one of the first or at least best known examples we know of, of G GIS being applied to public health, but it's exactly uh, the same type of, of capacity that we uh, have today. It's exactly uh, the same sort of thinking that we use today to try to address all the different thorny issues that we have uh, with, uh, with, with public health and, and, and with uh, health crises. Uh, we, we really first uh, got involved uh, with uh, uh, Enterprise GIS uh, during Zika uh, about four years ago or so. Um, we had, had uh, created maps before from, from desktop applications, but in terms of implementing a, an enterprise GIS, this was really our first foray into implementing that department-wide, and it was tremendously helpful for us. Uh, if you remember uh, Zika, Zika came to us uh, by way of the Southern Hemisphere uh, through uh, Brazil and, and Central America, uh, and before it landed in the United States, and this is a disease that's transmitted by mosquitoes mosquitoes that we have here throughout uh, most parts of the country, and, and it can have a devastating effect on uh, women who are pregnant or, or particularly their, uh, their babies when their babies are born. Um, we realized early on that it was imperative for us to understand where these cases were occurring. We, we knew about uh, some people with travel history, someone who had returned from the Caribbean or someone from Brazil who had a case of Zika that was diagnosed, but we really had very little information or ability to understand what was going on here in our state in terms of disease transmission. We knew we have the mosquito here that carries the disease. We knew that we had cases of Zika that were uh, potentially transmissible to other people, uh, but we didn't know how much disease transmission we have. And, and that's really where a GIS uh, really uh, made the difference for us uh, figuring that out in Alabama. We were able to create uh, maps uh, down to a, a census tract level that would show uh, uh, how many disease cases were located in a particular area. And as we saw clusters that popped up uh, among uh, different households, unrelated households in a, in a given census tract, uh, at that point, we knew that we had local transmission going on. We knew that we had a vector involved. We had a mosquito uh, involved. Uh, as it turns out, the mosquito that transmits this disease uh, only travels uh, two or 300 yards in its lifetime. It doesn't get around very far. So we were able to use uh, our, our, uh, our new uh, enterprise GIS to produce the individual data that we needed to know to go out and contact individual households in a given neighborhood. We could sort of draw a circle on the map uh, around a case, uh, and then we would use our environmental teams who would go canvas the neighborhoods and reach out to all the people within that circle that could be potentially uh, affected. We let them know that they needed to take uh, mosquito precautions. We asked them questions just to make sure they weren't sick themselves. Uh, and we uh, provided free inspections to look around their own property uh, for places where mosquitoes might breed so that we could limit the amount of mosquitoes in an area where we had a known case. So uh, this was really, uh, uh, in, in a sense, just good shoe leather epidemiology. It was good public health, but it's something that really had never been possible to us before uh, without the GIS capability that, uh, that we uh, had acquired. 
We then uh, thought about how we could bring this to bear on, on another public health crisis in our state, which is the opioid crisis. Um, Al Alabama has been affected tremendously by uh, the opioid crisis. Uh, we uh, have uh, many many people who are uh, have substance use disorder, uh, substance abuse disorder. We have uh, many uh, people who overdose uh, annually. We have many deaths that occur annually. Uh, and yet the, the thing that, that stands out about those times when we were first just starting to grasp that problem was how little actual data we really had. Um, we knew from some federal data that we had high levels of uh, prescription opioids uh, in our state. Uh, and yet our prescription drug monitoring program by statute uh, was not something that we could access. We knew that we had people being hospitalized or even dying in hospitals uh, from uh, opioid problems. And yet Alabama uh, was one of only two states that does not have a hospital discharge database. So even though we were aware of the problem, we had no way really to get at it. What we ultimately realized was how powerful a GIS system could be because we do have one source of data. We, as a uh, state health department, regulate our emer emergency medical service providers, They're the people who drive ambulances and respond to emergency calls. And so we were able to uh, use this system to uh, track uh, response to overdoses and also to track uh, the use of naloxone, the opioid reversal drug that people are given uh, when they're suspected of having uh, an opioid overdose. Uh, that's information that was already collected by our EMS providers, and we were able to put that on a map uh, and, and figure out exactly where uh, the, the risk was occurring in our state. Um, it, it's really remarkable. You could um, actually uh, make a, a really solid prediction about when a new crop of a potent drug had uh, been in, illegally introduced in the state because suddenly uh, within the course of, of several days, you would see clusters of overdose responses. You would see clusters of, of where naloxone was used and we could get that down to a county level uh, and, and use that in a way that we had never really uh, seen that before. Now everything is all about COVID all the time and, and it seems like for a year now we've barely done anything else and, and I, I have to say um, we, we could not have uh, had any kind of response at all uh, similar to what we're doing now without the GIS capability that, that we uh, now have. Um, we have used uh, GIS capability in so many different ways. I, I have a couple of quick examples to show you on the slide, but, but as you know, almost everyone now has dashboards by counties or by census tract level that give you numbers of cases and numbers of hospitalizations, numbers of deaths, uh, and so on. We've used similar maps to uh, help uh, identify the risk in school districts so that schools can make uh, good decisions uh, about uh, when to uh, go to virtual or when to uh, continue meeting in person. Uh, we uh, now are using the same exact thing uh, as part of our vaccination response. Uh, we are able to track vaccination rates by counties. We're able to break that down by demographic groups uh, within counties or within a census tract. Uh, it's a way that allows us to find out how many doses are being shipped to a given jurisdiction. Uh, many doses, of course, come through the state, but there are federal programs as well that ship doses that, that we don't necessarily have uh, knowledge of, or, or at least we don't have ready access uh, to that knowledge. Uh, and so this has been a tremendously helpful tool for us, just allowing us uh, to be able to keep track of those things. We uh, continue to, uh, to update this regularly. This obviously takes a tremendous amount of, of work on the part of many different people. It continually has been refined and modified. And uh, now we understand that we uh, have an expectation on the part of the public to demonstrate data in a way that we really never have had before. Um, the uh, amount of requests for this data, the amount of hits to the website, uh, uh, soon after the uh, pandemic uh, began last year, uh, we're in the millions of, of hits per day, uh, whereas we typically may have had a few thousand hits per week on our website for, uh, for almost everything combined. And so we, we understand now that this is a tool that's really important to helping us understand uh, how to do things better, but it's also tremendously helpful to uh, in terms of educating the public and making sure that people have uh, the information that, that they need. Uh, we, we certainly uh, have many different people that we would like to thank. There, there are too many uh, to thank and, I, and I'll leave too many people out, I'm sure. But, but I, I do wanna recognize uh, Ginger Bowling here at ADPH who's overseen this from the very beginning, has done a tremendous amount of work. 
we, we certainly are very grateful as well to uh, Eugene Namaste uh, at Esri, who's, who's uh, seemingly uh, works 36 hours a day because he's always available to us. Uh, has been tremendously helpful and, and helped to, to develop many of the things that, that have made our uh, efforts successful so far. So with, with COVID-19, uh, we, we have a lot of different tools uh, than we've uh, used perhaps uh, with other types of uh, uh, pandemics or, or epidemics or responses or public health problems. We're now uh, encouraging uh, broad, broad testing. We're using isolation and quarantine techniques. We're doing contact tracing. We're now we're doing vaccination. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is what Dr. Snow did uh, 160 years ago. When, the, when Dr. Snow finally ultimately realized the source of the cholera outbreak uh, on Broad Street in London, he uh, fixed it overnight by removing the pump handle. Uh, it took essentially a screwdriver, I guess, uh, removed the handle, no one could use the pump anymore, and the cholera outbreak subsided uh, within a few days. We are actually doing the same thing today. We're using all these tools now that we have at our disposal, and our goal really is to remove the pump handle. Our goal is, is to inform ourselves and help us make the best possible decisions we can so that we can protect the people uh, of this state, the people that we have a responsibility to care for. So thanks again for having me today. It's my pleasure to join you.